You know, I, I, I can't help, and I know I heard Caleb say something, and, and I had to walk through the, the gauntlet of people through the back. And uh, How good is that? How, how good is that? I, for, for you don't know, that's a good problem. Amen? That's a good thing. I mean, 17 years ago, was it five kids? I was thinking it was three kids. Yeah, we only had a few kids. And we started the children's church, and, and literally I remember saying this. I said, I, I can't wait for the day it takes 15, 20 minutes to get the kids out of here. You know, and, and prophetically that's happening, amen? And so it's exciting, you know. I mean, if you're with us for the first time, we're so thrilled that you're here. And if you've been with us for any length of time, we're still thrilled that you're here, even though we know you, amen? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> But God is faithful, and, and it's exciting just to see what God is doing. I, I tell you, I get overwhelmed sometimes just seeing the goodness of God and the grace of God and, and to see lives being touched and changed. And, you know, I get so excited when I go through town and I see somebody and they'll bump into me and they'll say, Pastor, you don't know me, but I went to your church and God changed my life or whatever. It's just exciting, amen? amen. It's fun. It's fun, amen? amen? It's fun to be a Christian, amen? amen. I... Uh, I want to tell you a story, and uh, I want to kind of lead to my message. But there's a story, and, and, and we remember the story about how the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt. And, of course, we know that God himself got them out. Moses brought them out. They wandered in the desert. And God met all their needs, everything they needed from manna, from water to quails, everything they needed, God provided and as they traveled through their times and places, they would run across different kingdoms and different countries and different situations, and they would see that each country had a king. And so they wanted a king for themselves. And even though God was like, hey, I'm doing all this for you. I mean, what better king than me? But you want a man king, I'll give you a man king. And so, of course, there comes Saul, and Saul's handsome Devonair, sophisticated, sort of like myself, amen? amen. <laughs> Very modest, <laughs> just kidding. But just a, you know, just, a, just a, a man that looked like a king, and so he becomes, Saul becomes king, and you know, we know the story, he's doing a great job, and all of a sudden he goes and he takes a kingdom, and God tells him, Saul, wait for Samuel to get there to sacrifice, and of course Saul, I mean, Saul's like, hey, I'm king, I can do what I want to do, and so he sacrifices, and of course, that's kind of where we get that, that scripture where it says it's, you know, obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. You know, it's better, you know, better to obey than give God something, amen? And so listen to what God has to say. And so after that, now God's going, okay, I'm going to give you a king that probably won't look like a king or think that, that what a king might look like. And so he tells Samuel, look, go to Jesse's house and... Samuel goes to Jesse's house, and he says, Samuel, look, out of Jesse's sons, it's going to be a king. And so Jesse goes, I mean, uh, Samuel goes to Jesse's house, and he begins to call all his sons into the room, and they're laying hands on all the boys, and it goes to one, and Samuel goes, nope, this ain't the one. And so you got another one, yeah, bring him in. Now these guys, some of the brothers and some of the sons that Jesse had, I mean, they were somewhat heroes in the military. These guys were manly men, you know, they were, they were godly big guys, and and so he's thinking this is what a king looks like. And, of course, everyone he went through was not the king until he finally said, hey, look, Jesse's thinking, I mean, Samuel's thinking, maybe I missed it. Maybe I'm at the wrong house. You know, sounds like us sometimes. We feel like we miss God, you know. Even, even the prophets felt that away, amen. And so he goes and he says, well, he says, I got one other boy. His name is David. And he's just an old ruddy old kid out there in the, in the field. He takes care of my, my sheep and. Of course, he says, well, bring him to me. And so, of course, David walks in the room, and as soon as Samuel sees David, he lays hands on him, and he goes, this is the one. This is going to be the king. And so, really, we learn a great story there is, you know, when the world sees a shepherd boy, God sees a king. And so we, we learn that, and, of course, now David's king. And now David is going into the kingdom, and now Saul knows about David. And this is where it gets really ugly. Saul knows that now David has the anointing, and Saul wants to kill David, okay? So now David is, you know, he's kind of 
fleeing for his life in several different situations. And, and now he begins to realize that Saul is serious and Saul's fixing to take him out. So now David flees to another country. And he goes to the country of Gath, which is the Philistines. And as he goes there, they see him, they see his men with him, and they realize that he has an anointing on his life. Now, I'm telling you this story because part of this story, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't never remember seeing it. I might have read it a thousand times, but I see something here that I never saw before. So he goes over to this other country, and as he goes into this country, the king of Gath sees David and all his men, jealous of him, realize that he has an anointing in his life, afraid now David's coming over here to take over his kingdom. Okay? So now all this is taking place. But David does something really weird. He begins to act like a madman. Go back and read it. It's in Samuel 21, 10 through 15. He begins to act like a madman. I mean, he starts foaming at the mouth. I mean, he starts acting crazy. And I mean, I mean, just delirious, you know. And all of a sudden, the king's like, this guy's nuts, you know. Leave him alone. And they left him alone. And that's kind of what he did that for. He wanted to do it, so he left him alone. But during this time... He's acting like a madman. He writes Psalms 34. I let all that to say that. How about that? Amen? Amen. We're going to read Psalms 34 now. So, well, Pastor, hey, you chase a rabbit to get there. We caught that sucker. Amen? Amen. Psalms 34. <clears throat> I will bless the Lord at all times. They're good. I mean, just, I, look, I, let me just say this. Sometimes, you know, I, I enjoy preaching. I enjoy God giving me a word. And I enjoy fellowship and, and sharing what God gives us. But sometimes we can just stand up here and read the Scripture and be done. Amen? Because the Scripture by itself is speaking God's Word. And we read these things and we see where they're coming from and we see how David is crying out and he says, I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. In other words, his praise will never leave his lips. He says, my soul shall make boast in the Lord. Listen, can, we t can I tell you this morning, when we brag on God, God shows up. See, when we brag on God, I would rather brag more on God now than show up one day and not brag enough. Amen. I brag on my God. My God's a big God. He's a big God. My God can beat up your God. Amen? Amen. He's a big God. And he goes on to say, he says, make boasts in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. In other words, when you're bragging on God, somebody might just be hanging on by a thread. But when they hear about you bragging on your God, they're going, I want more of his God. Amen? Amen. And so they, they'll be excited about that. He says, and magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together, which gives us a great example of when he says two or more come in agreement, he's there. He's, he's exalting together. He said, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. That goes back to the scripture in Timothy. He hasn't given a spirit of fear, but a peace, power, and a sound mind. They looked to him and were radiant. In other words, they were glowing. Their faces were not ashamed. Can I, let me just say this to you this morning. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody looked at you and goes, man, there's something different about you? There's something different about your, your look. There's something, and you might say, well, I've lost weight, or maybe I, I got a new haircut or whatever. But I'm telling you, when you got the presence of God radiating out of your life, people recognize it. People see it. And they see it, and they go, wait a minute, there's something about you that's different. That's God in your life, amen? amen. So this is the shine. He's saying, face it, we're not ashamed. He said, this poor man cried out. Listen, no matter if you're rich or poor, you cry out, God hears you, amen. okay? And the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him. In other words, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. The, the angel of the Lord, we all have protective angels around us, amen? amen. And he goes on saying, deliver them. And this is the verse here that, that I really want to build this whole thing off of. And I really want you to see because it's so important when he says this in verse 8. This is what he says. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. You see, sometimes we just need to taste. Amen. Come on. Sometimes we need to taste the goodness of God. See, it's the taste that brings you back. Amen. Come on, somebody. You have been to a restaurant and you ate something really good. And you thought, man, I, just, I, I need to have that again. So you go Amen. back because of the taste. You see, when we taste the goodness of God, that brings us back to God. When you take, listen, there's people today, let me just say this, there's people today that might be saved, might go to church, maybe been in church all their life, but have not yet tasted the goodness of God. Amen. Listen, when you taste the goodness of God, it's a flavor in your mouth that you cannot get rid of, that you don't want to get rid of, that you want more of. Amen. Come on, pal. Taste and see, he says. Then he goes on to say, blessed is the man who trusts in me. Trust in the taste. Let's keep going here. He goes and say, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, and some Seahawks and other ones too, but other than that, amen. Won't mention any names. 
You know what? I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> I said Seahawks, and I'm reminded of something. Come up here, uh, Kevin. Let us pray. No, I want to pray for Kevin. Really, honestly, those who don't know, Kevin was, was injured in the war, and he had to get out after 19, almost 20 years of service. And he's, he's got a, had several surgeries on his neck. And recently, he had a little incident take place, and, and he's having some problems with his neck, and it's really causing him really a lot, a lot of pain. And we're going to believe with him this morning. We're going, we're going to believe with him. Even though he's a Seahawk, we still could pray for him. Amen? I'm not a saint. Not a saint. But we, look, we're liable to convert him right now. Amen? <laughs> If God would heal you, would you pull for the saints? <laughs> but let's just pray. Reach your hand. Let's anoint him with all. The Bible says if you have sick among you, to anoint him with all. Pray the prayer. Brother Kelvin, stand up here with me as, as some of the elders, and we're just going to pray for him right now. Amen? Reach your hand up here. Let's pray for Kevin. Father, in Jesus' name, God, I thank you for Kevin. I thank you for him fighting for our country. And, God, we know that he was hurt. And, God, we know that the doctors have done a lot of things with surgeries and different things. And we thank you for the physicians. But, God, we thank you that you are the great physician. And, God, I thank you right now that his neck's going to line up with your word. His body's going to line up with your word. And all these things is causing discomfort and pain. God, you can heal him. And, God, I thank you right now that as we rejoice together the goodness of God, others will see and want to taste more. So, God, blessings be upon Kevin as you heal his body in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give God a hand. Amen. And he goes on to say, he says, uh, there is no want to those who fear him. And he says, the young lions lack and suffer hunger. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. That goes back to the scripture in Matthew. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else you need to be added. Okay? Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. There again, we're talking about wisdom. Who is a man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Goes and say, keep your tongue from evil. Boy, can I just stop right there. Amen. Amen. You got to be careful what you say. You know, we talk about the taste and taste buds are in the tongue, but you know what? Don't taste evil. Yeah, Amen? Amen? Taste and see how good God is. God's not evil. If you're tasting Amen. evil this morning, you're not tasting God. Come on now. If you're speaking evil, you're not speaking God. Amen. Can I rebuke you on that for a moment and still love me? And your lips shall speak deceit. And, and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Now, listen, let me tell you that. Sometimes we read these scriptures and we just kind of glance right over. It says, seek peace and pursue it. When you find something good, go after it. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, some of you here today, if you found a good thing in a wife, you went after it. Amen. Come on. If a, if a wife found a good thing in a husband, so that's a good thing. You pursued it. You seek. You went after it. Because, see, when we find something good, God's going to seek peace and pursue it. Yeah. When you find peace, look, go after it. Amen. Don't wait around letting somebody bring it to you get it for yourself. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such a have a contrite spirit. In other words, a remorseful, repentive. Whenever you cry out to God, and, and, and look, when you repent, look, you need a remorseful heart. You know, sometimes people repent only because they got caught. Oh, I hit a nerve there, didn't I? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He regards all his bones, not one of them are broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. I just need to make a rap song right there, amen? The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. Look, God redeems his servants, amen? And none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Now, we find another place later on in, in chapter 119. David, again, talks about the goodness and the sweetness and the taste of the word of God. And he says in Psalms 119, verse 100, he says, I understand more than the ancients. In other words, I understand more than times gone by. He's talking about the future. He said, look, this happened a long time ago, but I understand more than that now. See, if you're a born-again believer and as you grow with Christ, some of the things you learned a long time ago, you understand more today. Amen? Amen? We go forward with the things of God. If, you, if you're going back, that's called backsliding. Amen? We're going forward. He says, because I keep your precepts. In other words, I keep your rules, your commandments, I keep your law, I keep all these things. I have restrained, uh, restrained my feet from evil, from every evil way, that I may keep your word. See, God's word we need in our heart. I have not departed from your judgment, for, your, for you yourself have taught me. 
And he says this in verse 103. How sweet are the words to my taste, sweeter than the honey to my mouth. Isn't that good? You see, again, he says, through the precepts, I get understanding, though I have hated false ways. In other words, I don't like the false ways. And the more that you have this, this sweet taste of, of the word of God in your lips, and, and you enjoy the sweetness, and you enjoy the aroma, and you enjoy the goodness of God, when the false things come, it becomes bitter. Hello, somebody. When you got that sweetness in your mouth and you taste that sweetness, how many times you've eaten something really good and, and you chow it down and all of a sudden you bite into something really bitter? And all of a sudden it ruins the taste of the good in your mouth. So you recognize the bitter right away. And see, that's how we are. The more sweetness, the more sweetness of the Word of God, the precepts, the things that we learn, when the falseness comes in, we recognize it. And verse 105, which is a famous scripture, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, even baby Christians understand the sweetness of God. Even baby believers understand the sweetness of His Word. It says in 1 Peter 2, verse 1, it says, Therefore lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, uh, all evil speaking. It says, verse 2, As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted the Lord is gracious. Listen, when a baby tastes something good, he wants more of it. Amen? If a baby... Look, you cannot fool a baby. Let's just get honest. I got a dog. You can't fool my dog. I try to give him medicine. You know, I get these little flea tablets and stuff. And if I don't, if I don't put it with something sweet or something good, he spits it right out. You know what I'm talking about? And see, listen, that's why you, you, can't, you can't even fool a baby Christian. If a baby that, that, that receives Christ tastes the goodness of God and the grace of God and all the good things of God, all of a sudden something comes in his mouth, he spits it out. We should know the goodness and the grace of God in all our ways. Amen? Amen. Now, let's build this up today. And I'm, I'm trying to do this kind of quickly this morning as time is flying. But I want to talk about to taste the sweetness of God. Okay? Now, I said earlier because it's, it's somewhat disheartening, perhaps, when we're believers and, and, and we know who God is, but we struggle... We're talking about taste and see the goodness of God. We want to, we need to, but we don't. Okay, Pastor. What do we need to do? Here's the first thing. And this is really elementary. If you're going to taste the goodness of God, you have to begin by trusting God. You see, God's goodness is in His Word. And you can read the goodness of God, and you can see Him with your eyes. But until you trust the goodness of God, you never got that taste in your mouth. You see it. It's good. It looks good. Great rhyme. Makes a poem. Maybe even a song. But until you trust it, you have never tasted it. You've got to learn to trust. Amen. See, trust is an issue that many of us, because of hurt, because of past relationships, because of past employments, because of past re- friendships, because of past churches, because of past pastors, because of past leaderships, we struggle with trust. Well, you're not going to do me like the last guy did me. You're not going to hurt me like the last guy hurt me. You ain't going to hurt me like the last girl hurt me. And you know what happens? You never have that opportunity to taste the goodness of God. I said before, Julia and I are somewhat of an open book. I remember, Julia, and you hopefully you remember this too. We first was married, and, 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 and Julia's shared her testimony many times before. Men in her life abandoned her. Her father, a real father, those who don't know a lot of her testimony. And so she had a struggle with thinking that all men were the same. So I marry her. Now, when we would get into intense moment of fellowship, not argue, Amen. intense moment of fellowship, Amen. she had a way of pushing buttons in my life. She still can, amen? <laughs> Good and bad. <laughs> Amen. That's right. <laughs> you act like we're the only ones to do it, huh, baby? 
But, but she, would, she would push those buttons because, see, in her mind, she's thinking, everybody else left me. I'm gonna, he's going to leave me too until the day I recognize it. I'm so smart sometimes, amen? amen. <laughs> but I remember the day I recognize it. Yeah. We had good pastors, that's right, pastors. Good, good counselors. Yeah. But I remember the day I recognized it, and I remember we were in a tense moment of fellowship, and this is what I said. I said, I'm mad. I'm going to say some things I'm probably going to regret. I might even yell. I might even holler. I might even stomp. I might even da 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 But I want you to know something through all that. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving. And can I tell you, that changed a lot. Because, see, she knew. She knew that it was going to be okay. You see, and then we begin to taste the goodness of a relationship. Because before that, we had a bitter taste in our mouth because of previous relationships. Y'all, y'all getting this? Amen. That's good preaching, isn't it? Amen. Thank you. They're not amen in early, baby. You need amen a little louder, amen? amen? But when you taste the goodness of something you have, you see, we all have this jewel right before us, Brother Kelvin, and it's so good. And because of the enemy whispering things, we, we have a hard time trusting it. And if you never trust it, you never know how good it can be. Come on, somebody. Let me go on this side. <laughs> We have to begin to trust. See, see, God's not going to give us anything that's going to be bitter or nasty. He's going to give us what we need. It's himself. It's himself. You see, word is himself, is it not? So when we get the word, which is Jesus himself, wow, that's good stuff. Look with several scriptures. I mean, I'm not going to probably develop all of them. But over through the scriptures in Psalms, he talks about, blessed are those who put their trust in him. Another place in Psalms, it says, be angry, do not sin. Meditate your heart, uh, meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. So long. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Be angry and do not sin. Look, you can be angry and not sin. Amen? Amen? Yeah. You can be angry and not sin. I get mad at the devil all the time. And I not, don't mean I'm sinning. I'm just mad at it. So I want to kick him in the teeth. Amen? Psalm 17 says this, O Lord, my God, in you I put my trust. In you. Another place, Psalms 9, it says, The Lord also will be my refuge for the oppressed. A refuge in time of trouble, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. In other words, when you know the presence of God, when you know who God is, come on, somebody. When you know who he is and you know what he done and you know the life that, that without him you had, come on, then you begin to trust him and say, you know what, he's taken me thus far and he said he'll never leave me or forsake. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging bread. That's the promise we have in God. And so when you trust those things, he's going, okay, good boy, come a little closer. And you get that better taste of the goodness of who he is. And you don't want to leave it. You, you, look, you, you, my daughter-in-law makes this candy. It's like a caramel, it is. is caramel candy or whatever? It is, <laughs> it is caramel candy. I don't mind telling you, it's my crack. Amen? <laughs> I mean, when you eat it, it's like, you don't want to offer it to nobody. You don't feel greedy with your candy. Huh? <laughs> Because I know some people, if you offer it to them, they're going to say, sure, you know, so I don't offer it, I hide it, you know. I'm even, I even want to play, I even want to go downstairs where they live and dig and see if she's got some hidden, you know. You want to go down there and look. You know, drug addicts do all kind of stuff for their, for their, for their fix, you know. Why? Because that stuff's good. Amen? Amen? But see, that's how, that's how we should be with God. When we taste the goodness of God, you know, forgive me for, for being sacrilegious by saying this, but, but it should be our crack. It should be, we should be our addiction. You know, when you talk about Jesus freaks, we should be all Jesus freaks. Amen? Because we should all say, you know what? I want more of Jesus. Gosh, he, well, ooh, isn't that good? Yeah, that was good. I want some more of Jesus. Man, what did he do? Oh, he done good for me. I want more of him. Listen, I, I stand here before you and I propose that I hadn't got enough. Come on. Hello. I propose to you that even God is good in my life. 
I want more. Well, Pastor, are you selfish? Mm hmm. Yep. Why? Because he wants to give us more of himself. We, he, his desire is for us to be full. I'm not, I'm not filled yet. I'm not full yet. I want more of what he has to offer in my life. There's also times of wrong trust. The wrong trust is when we trust in ourselves. The Bible says don't lean on your own understanding. Second Corinthians says this in verse 1 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant. God don't want you to be ignorant. There's another place. I don't have it down here, but if you want to look it up, you can. It says if you want to be ignorant, just be ignorant. Yeah, yeah. That's what it says. If you want to be ignorant, be ignorant. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us from Asia, that we were burdensome before measure, above strength, so that we despise despair even of life. I'm sorry. Verse 9. Yes, we have the sentence of death in, our, in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in, who, in God who raised the dead, Amen. who delivered us from such great death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. See, go back again. It says that we should not trust in ourselves. You, you, you can't trust in yourselves. You need to trust in God. And, and another place is you can't trust in riches or money. Amen? Amen. And, and we need to quit asking money for permission. Amen. Come on, somebody. That's good stuff there. You see, when you trust God, now I'm not foolish. If you know me by any hand, I'm not a foolish guy when it comes to finance. I'm very good in finances. But I'm going to tell you real quick, several years ago, God broke me because I kept saying, we can't afford that. We, we can't, no, we can't. And God's going, did I ask you if you could? And finally, one day, when, when God's like, I want to move you out on the highway, I'm thinking, well, God, do you know how much money that land costs out there? He's like, yeah. <laughs> and you know what? I was like, okay, God, you can do it. And he did. You, you see what I'm talking about? Because, see, we trust in our own intellect. We begin to reason our own selves through our... Sandra and I was talking about this yesterday, being analytical, you know. We, we got plan A, B, C in the making. Instead of trusting. You see, we don't trust in the riches. He says, this is what he says here. He says, command those who are rich in the present age not to be haughty. He said, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. See, don't trust in the stuff and trust in the stuff maker. That's good, amen. Don't trust in the stuff and trust who made the stuff. His name is Jesus. Okay? And he goes on to say, he says, he gave us these things so we can enjoy them. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give. In other words, willing to share. See, here's the problem most of us have. We've got to be careful. When we begin to get blessed, God's going, I want you to be a blessing. Hello, somebody. Instead of saying, oh, give me, 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 like fat hogs, got bored. And not, look, God gives us so we can give it away. Amen. Here's the problem with some of us. If we're not careful, we take, we take, we take, and we have no room for nothing else. You've got to give it away to get more. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's free. We've got to be careful of all these things. Now, here's the second thing. Here's the second one right here is this. And this is really kind of strange the way I wrote this, but I'm strange anyway, so that's okay. I, I, I want you to see that, that when we taste the goodness of God, we trust we taste, we trust, because it goes back to even in the Psalms 34, he says, blessed is the man who trusts in him, right? Now, this is what we do a lot of times. If we're really going to taste the things of God, we have to be careful that we don't spit it out too soon. It's quiet. If you spit it out too soon, how will you know how good it is? How will you know? Many times we, 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 we take it and the response we expect don't happen and so we give up. We give up, we quit, and we quit on God too soon. This is what he says. This is what he says to us to do in John eight thirty one and several other places. I'm not going to develop all of them. This is one here I'm going to develop here. John eight thirty one says, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word. Now listen to me. If you want to taste 
the things of God, you've got to let it stay a little while. See, too many times we're just quick to spit it out. If you're going to taste the goodness of God, you've got to abide in the goodness of God. You've got to realize that sometimes it takes a little time to find the goodness of God. We want to take a bite, and when it don't respond to our palates the way we want it to respond, we spit it out. And God's going, man, you just fix and get to the good stuff. It's not exactly flavored, but, but you, there it is. It's not cotton candy. It's not this one. Listen, to, to enjoy the goodness of God and to taste the good things of God, you've got to take it sometimes and chew on it for a little while. You've got to let it kind of like get in the palates sometimes. You ever ate something and you just let it savor? You just let it, boy, just savor it, just kind of like just enjoy it. I mean, that's back good there. Just let it, just kind of like enjoy the, the flavor of it. You know, too many times, I, I have to be careful because of my swallowing conditions. Sometimes I have to be careful. I want to swallow it. And, and like now, I've learned to chew it a little bit more, you know. But see, that's how we have to do with the things of God. We've got to sometimes just chew on it a little while. Because he's saying, abide in me. Stay with me. Hang out with me. Be with me. Don't go nowhere. Let's keep reading this right here. It says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Case closed. You've got to abide to be a disciple. You've got to stay to be a disciple. If you abide in my word, you're my disciple. If you don't, you're not. That's pretty cut and dry. And he goes on to say, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, to know the truth, we have to abide in the truth. We've got to hang out with the truth. We've got to stay in the truth. We've got to stay where it's at. Instead of, Look, I don't mind telling you, and this might sound a little boastful, and that's okay. 17 years of pastoring this church, you don't know how good it feels. You don't know how good it feels when I'm in the community and somebody stops me and they say, you're a pastor. And I say, yeah. And, and I get to telling them, yeah, I'm a pastor in a Christian living fellowship. And out of my mouth, I love to say this. I love it because it just it's exciting to know that, 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 that I've had the opportunity to abide in his ministry by saying, yeah, and I've been there 17 years. Now, some of you don't get that. But I want you to just take a little survey of a lot of ministries and a lot of churches today. Don't stay. And, 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 and for whatever reason, I'm not throwing rocks because I don't know the circumstances, all the situations. And if God told them to move on, then they need to move on. But I'm going to tell you this, man. I love to know that God has allowed me to abide and I didn't run. Because there have been times in my life that abiding is a little bit more difficult than running. It's a lot easier just going, I'm going somewhere else. I'm out of here. You Leave that to the next guy and get on out of here. Instead of abiding. And, and, because, see, when you abide, then you got that person who's been with you, like Kevin, 17 years, can say, Pastor, we're with you. We moved all the way from Seattle to come back to be with you. You, you see what I'm saying? You see, that, that's abiding. Because I'm not saying this, I'm not, and, and Kevin, I don't think... I, I, I'm talking out of line, but I think if I would have left, you wouldn't have came back. I mean, that's the relationship. Does that make sense? You know, because we abide together. And he's always said, I'm coming back, Pastor. And, 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 and if I would have left, I would have missed it. Does that make sense? Amen. You see, when we abide in the things of God, we begin to taste the flavors. Man, that's got a little... Y'all, y'all remember the, the, the Willy Wonka, you know? The gobstopper or whatever. Oh, it's a little mashed potatoes and whatever. I mean, she's tasting all this kind of stuff. Oh, there goes a little French fry or whatever. You know, she's got this little gum. Huh? It was the gum. Was it gum? It was gum. Yeah. See, sometimes that's how it is with God. We, we, we begin to taste the goodness of God, and all of a sudden we're, we're like, we're in the goodness of God, and we're chewing on the goodness of God, and we're chewing on the fat. I love fat. Amen? If you're eating a steak, I like the fat. I just get rid of That's the tender part. Amen? If you cut your fat off, pass it over. Amen? Whatever. <laughs> It's got to be a scripture somewhere in it. Give me fat. <laughs> you know. But, but when, you, when you're savoring and you're eating the good things of God, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. Or you're chewing. All of a sudden, got a little piece there. That was good. Whew. Boy, I got that mercy. Man, that mercy was good. Whew. Oh, boy, did you feel that grace? Come on, son. My grace was tender. You, you see what I'm saying? When you abide in the things of God, you begin to, to, to get the things of God. You begin to have all those palates and all those things that God is trying to give you be fulfilled because God's saying, hang out with me for a little while. 
Don't leave me anytime soon. Now, we can talk about all this. I'm not going to get into all this. But one of the places it says in John 15, he's talking about the true vine. He says, I'm the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Now, we talked about pruning some time back. Pruning was a part of the sap in the tree is a healing process for the pruning part. Because all of us will be pruned at some level. All of us have a little dead cut off of us, and it don't feel so good in the pruning process, but it's the sap of the healing that brings, and all of us will be pruned. That's what he says, that it may bear more fruit. When you're pruned, then, then God cuts off the old stuff, and the new growth comes in. Amen? I mean, he might cut off one thing, and ten little spouts come out of it. Amen? Amen. Now, there's all kind of stuff talking about abiding me, and I'll let you read that for yourself. If you want to, John 15, read all through there. Uh, another place is talking about John 2.28. is talking about the children of God. And now little children abide in him, that when he appears we may be confident and not ashamed before him in his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him, which is kids of the Most High God. Amen? Now let's keep going. I, I want to kind of get through this thing. Boy, time is flying. We're talking about the taste and how good he is. When you have tasted the goodness of God, the least that we can do is to become living sacrifice. Now, I'm not talking about the band living sacrifice, but I'm talking about living sacrifice. Amen? I'm talking about living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, the least you can do. In other words, as a living sacrifice, when we taste the goodness of God, what we're saying is, God, I like what I taste. God, I'm going to give you my life totally. I'm going to sacrifice myself to you. Now, when we hear this word sacrifice, we think of something horrible as death. But God just says, listen, I want you to totally give me your life because I know better to do with your life than you do. He knows more about what we need. I guarantee you right now, I guarantee there's people in this room that could probably say, I wish I'd listened to my parents. <laughs> no, Daddy, I don't want to go to college. I want to work with my hands. <laughs> You're thinking, oh, Daddy, I wish I'd have took your word up and went to school, you know. <laughs> no, Mama, I know I, I, I know I, I mean, I can say all kinds of things. I'm trying to filter it, amen, because some of you are going, uh, that's me. <laughs> but, but. Living sacrifice is, is we're saying, God, I want to trust you. As I abide with you and I hang out with you, the least I can do is trust you and just sacrifice myself to you and totally commit my life to you. Let's keep going. Here's the next thing. As we begin to taste the goodness of God and the grace and the mercy of God, this is what happens to us. We become tender-hearted. Come on, somebody. Because, see, you can be hard-hearted. But when you taste the goodness of God, you become tender-hearted. See, tender-hearted people go, if it wasn't for the grace of God, that could be me. Instead of being hard-hearted and going, look what they're doing. Can you believe Sister Big Bottom, you know, or Brother Do Nothing or whatever? What you're saying is, listen, being tender-hearted is saying, that could be me. I want to be tender-hearted. I, I want, let's read this. Let's go back and read it, okay? Uh, Ephesians 4.25. Therefore, put in away lie, lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we're members of one another. Be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, that's a good one there. Is, is if you've got a problem with somebody, don't let the sun go down. Get it right. Nor give place to the devil. Again, don't give any place to the devil. Let him bestow still. Let's just jump down. 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom we are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, calamity, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. See, when we become tender hearted, we begin to forgive others as Christ forgave us. You see, when we taste again, when we taste the goodness of God, something happens to our heart. Because, see, you want others to taste it too. 
Now, for some of us, you know, we taste the goodness of God and we're trying to share things with others, and, and some people don't want it. And I get that. Now, here's what some of us do. <laughs> Yuck, you want to try it? You ever see somebody do that? They, they, take, they take a sip. <laughs> Yuck, you want some? Yeah, I want some. I want to be yuck too, you know. But when we, we have that goodness of God about it, and we taste something good is when we want to share it. Instead of going, yuck, taste this. I don't want any. I don't want none of that. I want what's good. Boy, that's a good one up there. You run your mouth about how bad things are at your church, and then you invite your neighbors, and you wonder why they don't come. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I, I love this church because it's, it's a real church. Yeah. What you see is what you get. And some of the kindest people in the world are here. And I will tell you in a, in a quick heartbeat, I, and just to lay this out front, and maybe I, maybe I should have said it earlier, but as your pastor, you can attack me all day long, and I won't fool with you. Because I, I get that. I understand the position. I understand that that. Anytime you're in any kind of leadership position, you're going to be attacked. I get that. But when you fool with my wife, my kids, or my sheep, I'm coming for you. And you ain't going to mess with them. Amen? Praise God. Give God a hand. Amen? It's not me. It's God. Because anytime I see young sheep being attacked by wolves, brother, I'm, gonna, I'm pulling out the big guns. I got guns. Amen? I will mark you in a heartbeat. Because if I think that you're hurting the sheep in this church, I would do everything spirit, spiritually, biblically correct to correct that. Because there are people out there that I see babies get hurt all the time. Sheep get hurt and never, ever recover. And if you're telling me, well, I just got a gift of speaking on my mind, that's what I want to say to you. That's a gift that God don't mind you keeping. Amen? You can keep that gift. But that was free. That wasn't even part of the message. Here's, here's what we say in the South about being tenderhearted. Here's what we say in the South. <laughs> and I don't know why this is so, but this is so. This is South. If you're not from the South, I Ohio, different ones, I know you're not from the South, but this is what we say in the South. When somebody does something wrong, we, we, we cure it. We, we, we immediately dismiss, just, just totally dismiss it by saying, bless his heart. <laughs> well, brother so-and-so just run off with all the money. Well, bless his heart. <laughs> Sister so and so just beat her husband to a point. Well, bless his heart. Bless her heart. Bless you know. <laughs> Did you hear about so and so? They robbed the bank. Oh, bless his heart. It like makes everything okay, you know. <laughs> That's a southern healing, amen. amen. That should be biblical right there, amen. amen. Should be in Psalm somewhere, like when you pray for somebody, just go, bless his heart. And everything's good. Here's the last thing this morning is this, as we, time is gone, is some things leave a bad taste in our mouth. We get that. Some things do. And this is what we have to be careful of. This is the, how I want to end with this right here. Sometimes, you know, we taste things that leaves a bad taste in our mouth. Don't let it cause you to become easily ensnared. Easily ensnared. And let me read this to you. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 1, he's talking about the race of faith here. And he says, therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, in other words, people are cheering us on, let us lay aside every weight and sin which easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, that thing goes on to talk about uh, at least you become weary and discouraged. It talks about how a father chasing his children, and it's good that God corrects us. I mean, all those things. You want to go back and read that chapter, verse 12, that's a good thing. But the part that I really want to end on is this, is we have to be careful that when we do taste, and sometimes we taste God, and sometimes things happen and it leaves a bad taste in our mouth, for us to be careful that we don't become easily ensnared. Because when we easily ensnared, it, 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 it takes out the light. We lose the enlightenment of, of truth. We lose the enlightenment of what God really wants for our life because all we, are, well, all we have is that, 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 that defense, offense or whatever it is. We're easily ensnared. We easily get ourselves in trouble. Now, sometimes we, we talk about laying every weight. Sometimes weight is not sin. Yeah. 
It's just wait. Okay? And, and, and there's a story, and I think, do you have that? I don't throw it up yet, but I want to tell this story. Y- y'all sit up ready to throw that picture up? Uh, I read the story, and I thought it was so cool because I thought it really fit <clears throat> us today. And the story goes, there was a guy who was a shepherd, and he had some sheep. And a shepherd that has sheep shears them, okay? And he cuts the hair off on and he sells the hair. That's what, that's what he does. That's what the farmer does. That's how he makes his living. He shears the hair off the sheep. And so he's shearing the hair off the sheep. And the, and the, the average sheep that you shear, you get about 10, maybe 15 pounds between there. And that's a lot, okay? But the story had it where the shepherd had this sheep and this particular sheep that just got lost. It, it don't seem like when you say sheep. Sheep's a single plural? Yes, it is. Is it single? It sounds warning. Singular or plural. Just like deer. Deer. You don't say deer. deer. Anyway, he had a sheep. <laughs> had a sheep? Can you say a sheep? Yes. Okay. Sounds funny. Us <laughs> Cajun will say everything backwards, so, you know, we'll, we'll butcher it. He had, he, he's having a sheep, amen? He had a sheep that, that he had, and the sheep got lost. And it was lost for six years. And the sheep that was lost for six years began to carry all this weight. This is what it looked like. (laughs) (laughs) Fluffy. Now... They said when they sheared the sheep, I said earlier that, that a normal sheep gets about 10 to 15 pounds the most. 60 pounds came off that, that one sheep right there. 60 pounds. Now, this sheep here, I don't mind telling you, it couldn't move very fast. And it probably had a hard time getting from point A to point B. And see, that's how we are when we're ensnared with false truth. We let the weight of the world just build upon us, build upon us, instead of running from side to side, rejoicing about the goodness of God, how good God is, taste and see, we're barely moving. We're carrying all the weight of the world. We're trying to run this race with all these weights strapped to us as the sheep was lost for six years. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you've been lost, not spiritually lost, but just lost in in the goodness of God. You could be a believer and still just haven't tasted the goodness of God. Maybe something's taken place and you've been ensnared and this weight has been building on you and you just feel like you've just kind of gone through the motions, but you're barely getting by, you're barely moving. You don't have any endurance with you at all because of the weight of the world that's still on you. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. No one looking around. Just give me a second. We're closing. But maybe you're here today, and maybe for whatever reason, you say, Pastor, I, I struggled with tasting to see how good God is. <clears throat> or maybe you say, Pastor, there was a time in my life, man, I was just really in, enjoying the goodness of God, and the grace of God, the mercy of God, and something happened, and really kind of relating to the story. You just got kind of lost and, and you begin to build up and now you got all this extra weight, so to speak, hanging on you, spiritual weight that's hanging, that's holding you back. And this morning, I want to pray for you. That's what I want to do. I want to pray for those who say, Pastor, I, I'm struggling with tasting the goodness of God. I'm feeling the weight of the world. Uh, all, whatever, however this fits your life. Again, I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you stand. None of these things. just want to pray for you. If you say, Pastor, maybe, maybe you went through a divorce. Maybe you went through a child problem. It doesn't matter. Pastor, that's me. Would you pray for me this morning? Heads bowed, eyes closed. No one looking around. Just raise your hand and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. I see hands popping up. Anywhere else? I just want to pray for you. I see those hands. I see that hand. Anywhere else, I see that hand. Anywhere else, I see that hand. Anywhere else, I see that hand. I see those hands. Anybody else? I just want to pray for you real quick and let you go. Thank you, Jesus. 
Father, you know the reason because of being ensnared and just whatever has caused him not to be able to taste the goodness of God. God, if you're in church any length of time and you're serving, we know that we get hurt. People get hurt all the time. But God, today is a new day. Today is a day of freedom. A day is a day, today is a day of breaking the back of all this pain and all this weight and all this misery. God, free your people today. God, hands were popped up all over. and God, you know exactly what they need. And so, God, I pray you be in the supply what they need according to your riches and glory. Not our own, but yours. And God, we honor you today. We honor you with your victory. Honor you that we can come and, God, become a kid of the Most High God. And, God, I thank you that you're going to free us up from having all this ensnared trouble and weight and everything else about us. God, I thank you for that freedom. I thank you that we can taste and let those who raise their hand taste the grace and the mercy and the goodness of God in their life. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. Just give me one more second. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. Or maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, there was a time I was serving the Lord. I'm just backslidden. Let's get that right today. Right there where you're at between you and God, search your heart and pray this prayer. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I repent of my failures. Jesus, I repent. Jesus, come into my life today. Jesus, come into my heart today. Jesus, Take over my life. I just surrender my life to you today. Jesus, I want to live for you and you in my life and I'm in yours. And God, just take over. If you prayed that prayer this morning, maybe for the first time, or maybe it's a prayer rededication, again, it doesn't matter. I just want to pray for you this morning. If you prayed that prayer, I'm not going to embarrass you or call you. I just want to pray for you. Just raise your hand and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I see those hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? I just want to pray for you. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anyone else? I see that hand. Anyone else? I see that hand. I see those hands. Father, I thank you today for saving us. I thank you for redeeming us. God, I thank you for your saving grace. Now, God, I pray as hands lifted up, that, God, that you'll begin to redeem them. And, God, let them know that they're a kid of the Most High God. Let them know that you love them. Let them know that you died for them. And, God, let them know that they hadn't been forgotten or forsaken. And, God, put them in good fellowship. God, get them plugged into good friends and fellowship and good company. And, and God, we thank you for saving souls. We thank you for changing our lives. We thank you that we can taste of your goodness. Blessings be upon each and every one on this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you receive that word, let's give God a hand. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet as the ushers come. And